Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to the show. This is Anthony. And this is James. Today, we're going to be doing Fight Club. Came out in 1999. One of our all-time favorite movies. We've seen this a ton of times. I mean, One of the highest rated IMDb. Yeah, I think it's top 12 or something like that. I think that. it's an 8.9. 8.8, 8.9 around there. It's just a wildly popular film, cult classic. Um, one of David Fincher's best movies. You could argue it's his best film. You know, I, I could agree with that. Uh, budget of 63 million worldwide gross of 101 which wasn't amazing it's still profitable but in terms of being a cult classic film this is probably one of the biggest dvd sales films of all time no it actually it barely barely profited it probably lost a little money in the box office yeah be, um, when you factor in the marketing but then it was one of the early it was probably the biggest cult classic in terms of dvd sales because dvds hadn't been, been out for only a few years by then VHSs were still being used at this time, you know? And so this movie erupted in popular culture, word of mouth. People were recommending it to friends like, oh, did you see this movie Fight Club? Go to Blockbuster and rent it. It's amazing. And so over a couple of years, it became wildly successful. It earned over $100 million just on DVD sales and rental sales. In what, the first year or something the like that? The first couple of years, Which yeah. is insane. And, you know, it seemed like Chuck Palahniuk, with this story, with the novel, he really tapped into something that a lot of people resonated with, whether it be men or women. It's obviously a, a film marketed and directed and, and kind of written around men and their experiences in the postmodern world. And I think that there's a reason why so many men out there have connected with this film. But also, I know plenty of women that love this movie. They think it's a classic. They're huge fans of David Fincher and this story as well. So... I don't think it's just a movie for men at all. I think it's a movie for all sorts of people in this postmodern Western world because the film tackles a ton of different themes, basically dissecting postmodernism world and this the culture we're living in now, whether it's consumerism, anti-conformity. Um, there's so many things to talk about and dive into, but I just think it's a film that is misunderstood in general. I think a lot of people look at the surface of it. They see it's oh, just a movie, bunch of guys beating each other up in a basement. It's so much more than that. <laughs> it's It's an immense dense story full of interesting characters themes dark dark themes positive themes um it's alluring enticing but also dangerous and promiscuous at the same or and yeah something like yeah yeah at the yeah, same time yeah i i think it's misunderstood not just because of people might think it's a little simple but i think that the themes are misunderstood as well and we'll get into them later and i'll explain why i think a lot of the themes that are kind of misunderstood by audiences generally um, but I'll get more specific when we get into it. But also, I think that this movie, what sets it apart from other films and why it was such a, a big success is because of the tone of it and the style of it. And nothing like that had ever been done before. No one had ever captured on film like this new kind of film tone of like that's punk rock attitude in the filmmaking. And, mm -hmm. you know, this like F you to the world in the actual production of the movie. You know what I mean? Like, it's just not just the story and writing, but the way David Fincher wrote, directed it and the production design and the characters. And the whole thing is just a big middle finger to, you know, the idea of the modern world. The establishment. Yeah, the establishment. And before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost podcast is to share us with your family and friends and become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Patrons get perks like personalized videos, podcast schedules for upcoming ep episodes. Top tier patrons get a monthly shout out on the podcast, which we just did last week. A lot of fun. The best perk of all, though, is every single patron, the $2, $5, $10 patrons, all have access to weekly bonus episodes of the show, which we post on every Wednesday. We also do fun giveaways and stuff like that. And we're very interactive on Patreon as well. So you can message us anytime. Head on over to our website, RaidersOfTheLostPodcast.com to check out all of our content, our merch, Follow, subscribe wherever you're listening. Hit the notification bells. And thank you so much for tuning in around the world. Now, let's get back into David Fincher's classic, Fight Club. It's crazy to say this is a classic now. Well, I mean, <laughs> I feel old. it just hit its 22-year anniversary in September. That's crazy. A couple, like a week ago. Yeah, and this I think this movie solidified David Fincher's status as one of the greats of um, the generation before us of filmmakers in terms of he did Seven, uh, Panic Room. is a very good movie, but wasn't that big obviously people it's not in the zeitgeist but do you do seven and fight club within a few years of each other that's a big deal and like this movie really catapulted him into critical acclaim as an accomplished filmmaker plus the game which is a very yeah. underrated film I, I highly recommend anyone checking that out if they love suspense and thrillers and stuff like that so, yeah but i'm saying seven was a oh yeah yeah seven was a mean. huge movie when it came out yeah and and then this movie was gigantic they're, they're as well incomparable in terms yeah. of response obviously yeah 
But um, I'm just saying that he's already made he's made so many great films. You know, his, his catalog is endlessly good. He's got a great catalog. He's, <laughs> he's great. And what I, what's so great about Fight Club is we have three very interesting characters. We have the narrator, played by Edward Norton. Then we have Tyler Durden, played by Brad Pitt. And Marla Singer, played by Helena Bonham Carter. And they're in this sort of love triangle journey together. The three of them, whether all of them connect in the, or are in the same room together at the same time or not. And they're experiencing this these feelings and emotions that really hadn't been expressed in film, really, you know, in terms of not just depression, but the nihilistic feeling of is life meaningless cynicism and yeah. paranoia and insomnia like they've been dabbling. But to the extent that Fight Club took the in the approach that Fincher took and mental lot, illness. Yeah, yeah. But just compounding just. Uh, di like diving into it more than I've ever seen before. And also, they became iconic in terms of fashion. Marla Singer, that character's look was very big for the next five years after this movie came out. Like, that that cr gothic, punk rock, manic pixie dream girl was like a big style for several years. Like, with that kind of hair and, you know, uh, dark clothing and, you know, ripping cigarettes all day. And then also Brad Pitt's style and attitude and especially his hair and this move in this role as well became iconic in the fashion world as well so these this movie the, those two characters had major influences on popular culture with in terms of style and fashion for or, young people yeah. the aesthetic in general of yeah. the film and then obviously ending the film with the pixie song was iconic too mm -hmm. huge because that was just one of those independent rock bands that not maybe everyone had heard of at the time and, and then this is a film where you can see i think that david fincher even though he shoots digitally now you can still see on these films where he shot with film that's his his aesthetic. His aesthetic is still very much there. This almost feels like it was shot digitally. I think it, I prefer his movies that look that are shot on film as opposed to digital. I know he has more control over digital and he likes to see as it is. And but I just think that the film aesthetic of this movie and a Fight Club and the game, uh, they're really gorgeous movies. This one in particular is extremely well shot. There's so many so much amazing inventive and creative photography and film and um filming styles in this film. I think that he really honed his craft and his visionary story telling devices and techniques with this film especially. Yeah, especially because it might be the best script that he's worked with, which is saying a lot because I mean Seven's a great script, Gone Girl's a great script, and it's coming off the novel by Chuck Palahniuk and it's been adapted by Jim Ulse, who's the screenwriter of the film. And the the script is so good. It has so many great pieces of dialogue that are just plucked directly from the novel. I don't know if you've read the novel, but I have. It's different. Whoa, whoa. did you guys hear that? I, I've read a book before. <laughs> guys, he read the novel. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, you don't know how to read. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those rare situations where it's it's like, is the book better or the movie better? And I think that the movie's better in different ways, but I think if you haven't read it, you should definitely check it out because it is different. I, actually, I have read it. Oh, wow, yeah, cool. I've read good, it. Good for you, But man. it was a long time ago. Yeah. Just want to clear the air. What did you think about it when you read the book? Um, I think that I liked the movie better when I read it, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think I'm, I feel the same way. Usually, I, it's the reverse for yeah, me. I just think because Fincher is such a genius visual storyteller, he really expanded on the story itself in terms of adding so much to it. You know what I mean? The, the novel is really well written, and the ideas and themes in the dialogue, it's so cool and very. it was very new. These are things that people were talking about. And then what Fincher did with the visuals was just groundbreaking, I think. Yeah, and there's so much to talk about, but it's hard to figure out where to begin. But I would say it'd probably be best to start with the narrator, played by Edward Norton. Let's start with the narrator. Who's this character who is sort of just lost in life, and he seems like he has no purpose in life. He's docile. He's passive. He suffers from insomnia. He is obsessed with his what he calls the Ikea nesting instinct where he's trying to fill his life with in with meaning by consumerism. You know, every time he sees a cute coffee table with yin yang, he has to have it. Or he, he's ordering from the catalogs in Ikea. We've all been to Ikea, but I love Ikea. He's, he's substituting uh, life with products. And consumerism is a major theme of this film. And I think that the narrator suffers from uh, an identity crisis, obviously. Very much so um, expressed with the creation of his imaginary friend Tyler Durden. Guys, we're just going full spoilers. We're, Everyone's we're seen all it. assuming you've Everyone seen Everyone knows Fight the twist. Club. So that his manifestation of lack of identity is is creating Tyler Durden. But he himself has lost his identity as a man in the modern world, as an individual in terms of what he's doing 
um, his life has lost meaning in terms of he's not doing anything he's passionate about. You know, he works at the job that he hates and everything is a copy of a copy of a copy, meaning that everything is identical to everything else. And there is no meaning to anything he does. And that's this is why he can't sleep. He has this the, the burning desires in, within him to live life to the fullest, but he's closed it off entirely. And I think that this movie says a lot about embracing your own identity and creating in, in, in trying to delve into understanding who you are and how to put that into the world rather than letting the world tell you what to be. Yeah, just but I don't want to get into Tyler and his philosophy yet, but overall, I agree 100% with you. The film isn't about like starting a fight club and just quitting your job. It's about it's more about living an authentic life, like finding your purpose, finding what you're meant to do or what makes you feel alive versus the narrator who feels no life at all. He, he's got that nihilistic approach where life is meaningless and I'm just going to work. I'm a worker bee. I'm fulfilling other people's expectations. I'm fulfilling my boss's expectations, who I hate. And in terms of why it's a fight club, and you can see in the scenes when people start fighting for the first time, you can see the, the looks of like glee on their faces, even though they're covered in blood and beaten to a pulp, and the this like release of pleasure and this release of all the tension. And it's because all of these men in this movie, they're not feeling anything anymore. They're just numb in life. Well, let's talk about why they're numb and yeah. why they don't feel anything. Yeah. You could probably and argue. So I'm just saying the feeling pain and also inflicting pain makes them feel something for the first time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what Tyler talks about in his philosophies as he gets going with, with the narrator is he's talking about basically the, the men in this world and this, this generation, you know, they're they've been emasculated you know they don't have an identity they've been rejected by society they've been rejected by their father figures both tyler and narrator have been rejected by their father figures in a way for tyler it's, his father was never really around he just calls him once a year to tell him what to do and he does all those things and he's like now what whereas the narrator never really knew his father he left when he was six years old but he says he also had the same phone calls yeah same phone calls but also his father was setting up different franchises of families like every six years he'd move to a different location. So both these characters, and you can assume many of the characters in the film have no father figures, whereas, and even if they had a biological figure in life or some sort of father figure, maybe they weren't there for them. Maybe they were working too much. Maybe they weren't completely in their lives. Maybe they weren't supportive emotionally or or just supportive in general. I have a crazy theory about father figures in this movie. Let's, let's hear it, bro. So I think that Tyler, as the narrator, never had a father figure in his life and so i think that when tyler and narrator have that conversation in the bathroom talking about how yeah i call my my dad up see what do i do go to college okay and then i graduate then i call him up again now what do i do get a job and then i do i get that and then i call him up and again now what do i do get married and so what i think is what i think that is a metaphor is towards is the father doesn't exist. It's the father is the expectations of our society. The expectation to you have to go to college. The expectation to you have to have a, a normal job. The expectation to you have to get married and start a family. And so there is no father in narrator's life. There never was. It's the the society and civilization acts as the father figure, telling t telling narrator what he should and shouldn't do. And also there are hints to narrator's childhood because when Marla and and Tyler never are always, they use the narrator as a middleman to communicate between them, right? And they're never in the, in the same room at the same time. His parents pulled the same act. Exactly. So, I mean, that this is a precursor to saying that narrator probably imagined his dad, just how he's imaginary, imaginary, imagining Tyler. So maybe he had a mom, but he imagined that he had a dad. And or, they were never in the same room at the same time. It's That's definitely possible. And even just to com compound on the fact that, like you said, he didn't have a father figure growing up, you could argue that... Tyler represents or he created Tyler as a father figure because most people even even people who have like biological fathers or or some other kind of father in their life they generally move on from that father to latch on to another father figure you know what I mean they and they sort of become an apprentice an apprentice in a way basically yeah. took the words right out of my mouth yeah. and so a wicked smart guy for for narrator he never had that original father figure so you could argue he created Tyler as a way to cope with his current life situation and also in addition to create a father figure for him to follow and to apprentice under. And also there are hints to the rumors about Tyler's history where members of Fight Club say, have you heard that he was born in a mental institution? 
Maybe that's really how where narrator was born. Maybe his mother was mentally ill and disturbed. And that could be a reason why he is the way he is. It's possible. So I think that there are a few hints. And I think clearly, if you read beneath, beneath the surface, I doubt that narrator ever had a father in his life. Yeah. And I love the some of the dialogue. Well, all the dialogue that Tyler, that Tyler says. It's so enticing and intriguing. And you can understand why so many maybe men who feel like they have, they're lost in this world are so attracted to it. You know, a lot of what Tyler says is attractive. However, I don't agree with everything he says. You know, I think specifically like the things he says where self-improvement is self is uh, masturbation, you know, but he's more interested in self-destruction. I personally am big on self-improvement. I don't think there's really anything wrong with it as long as it's, it's for a good goal. I think that's what he's talking about, what the goal of your self-improvement is. If it's just to look like a model on Calvin Klein, maybe that's the negative aspect of it. Yeah, exactly. And so that's actually an example of the masculinity element of this movie where masculinity in this film is shown as being a good thing that should be embraced, but also too much masculinity can be a bad thing. Hence, masculinity being a good thing, improving yourself, improving your body, improving your health, improving your mind, those are good qualities. But then taking it too far to obsess over making yourself look perfect, that is hyper hyper masculinity taking it too far. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of definitely that line for sure does not fit. And I love when he's talking about how his, his first speech really in Fight Club, you know, after Narrator and Tyler fight in the parking lot and then they start fighting at, outside of Lou's for fun after they're drinking and they start doing it in the basement and he gives his first speech and he's talking about He's talking about the generation of, of these men. You know, they're the middle children of history. They've had no war, no Great Depression. Their war is a spiritual war. Their Great Depression is their lives. You know, he's basically saying that no one wants us. We've been rejected by our father figures. We've been rejected by society. No one wants anything to do with us. And we're pissed off about it. You know, what, what are we going to do to feel alive if there's no point in life if no one wants us? And also in that speech, so that's the first part. You pointed out perfectly. And the second part is the the basically the advertisement of what the perfect life is like that men and women are inundated by through marketing and advertising. And he talks about how we're all raised to believe that we're going to be rock stars and movie gods and, you know, famous. And uh, but then he says we, we and then we slowly learn that that's not going to happen. And that makes us very mad. So what he's saying is like when we see all these images like a perfect body on a Calvin Klein ad or like this really cool male model in a Gucci ad or, you know, a super famous actor in a movie or, you know, a rock star playing in an arena, you know, that can off that can inspire people for sure, but also can make people feel like small, like that. That's never going to be me. Uh, I will never achieve that. I wish I was like a superstar super famous, super successful that everybody loves, but you know, I'm just a, a normal person that nobody knows. And so that can cause quite a lot of distress in people's lives and their minds. It can affect their, their confidence and also a, a, affect their self-opinion, something that's been even more heightened by social media when you see all these perfect people having a living what we think are amazing lives and every moment is so cool, but my life is boring and I don't do anything and my life kind of sucks com in comparison. So we're always being compared to these things we see on a billboard, in a commercial, in a movie. And when you compare it to your own life, even though there's nothing wrong with living a simple life, sometimes with people, it can affect them very negatively. And that's, I think, what they're getting to with that line in particular. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. It's gotten so much worth, worse with social media, not just with images, but like in terms of the algorithms that are written to show the same things that we're constantly consumed by that we, we can't look away because this film obviously has a ton of anti-consumerism elements. Like, for example, Fincher put a Starbucks cup in every single time and he, he destroys a Starbucks. He's basically saying nephew to corporate America and corp well, corporate Western culture in general and consumerism. And I think that's the what you're talking about with being a rock star and a movie star, well, in terms of the algorithms, what's even scarier is, you know, we were talking about this earlier today that some of the smartest people on the planet Earth right now are writing algorithms. They're writing code. Their their entire job is designed to keep you looking at ads, looking at marketing and staying on these social media platforms. So it's even gotten so much worse compared to 1999 when it was just billboards and commercials in, in movies. And so here's the driving force between all of that. And it relates, it ties right into Fight Club, even though Fight Club came out years before smartphones were invented. So apps are driven by ad revenue. 
And so the longer they can keep you looking at their apps, whatever it is, or websites, the more marketing they can employ on their devices, on their websites, on their social media apps. And the more ads you look at, the more likely you are to buy certain products. And so everything is driven by ad revenue. And the reason why, and this ties to the movie in terms of um, consumerism, in terms of talking about going back to like the, the billboard of the Calvin Klein model, um, buying stuff on Kia, because in the, I actually used to, I used to be in um, photography. Uh, photography, commercial photography, and I left it because I, I slowly understood that what I was doing was adding to the cycle of trying to entice people to buy stuff they don't need using beauty and perfection and, and, and Unre- en- enhancing that. Yeah, enhancing it and creating un- and photographing unrealistic lifestyles and unrealistic people to entice people to make them feel less about themselves like, so they can v- buy this product to make to buy this product to make them feel better. And so that's the whole point of the idea of consumerism in the movie is that it's it's, un- it's addressing the fact that why do you buy a Gucci bag because the advertisement's super cool and you want to be like that you want that in your life or you want this new table because you know what it'll add this thing that i think is missing in me in my life but it really isn't and you want to look a certain way you want to buy this cool jacket or wear your hair a certain way because you were inspired by like a movie character to like look cool like they look cool and so you're constantly buying things to try and fix yourself when ultimately there's nothing to fix you are everyone is unique and great in their own way and what we have to do is embrace who we are and express that rather than trying to attain this stuff that is ultimately meaningless and it's driven to us as a way of corporations to profit off of our jealousy and envy and lack of confidence. And living an authentic life in a perfect example of, like I said, this movie isn't about quit your job, start a fight club and tell your, and get in a fight with your boss and just, oh, I don't need money or anything like that. That's not what this movie is saying. It's saying live an authentic life. And the perfect example of that is when they're at the convenience store and at gunpoint, Tyler Durden holds the convenience store clerk at gunpoint with his license and he's talking to him about what he wanted to be. You know, you want to be a veterinarian. Why'd you stop? At, why'd you stop? Too much schooling. If you're not on your way to become a veterinarian in six weeks, then I'm going to find you and I'm going to kill you. What he's doing obviously is illegal and it's a crime. You shouldn't point guns at people. It's a terrible thing to do. But but the idea of it, even the narrator after it happens, he's like, you got to hand it to Tyler. He had a plan. What he's forcing this man to do is live that authentic life. He didn't want to go to school. What are you going to do? Die in the back of this convenience store? You're going to be a convenience store clerk and just this is where you're going to die right here in the back of it, in the alleyway? Or can you live an authentic life, live a life that has meaning and purpose, which is what you've always wanted to do? And also, just to tie back into the consumerism and marketing and everything like that, I think you touched on one of the two elements of why it's so present in the film and in the story. I think the other reason is why is in this postmodern society, there's hardly any more religion, faith, spirituality out there. A lot of people, what are they putting their faith into? What are human beings putting their faith and beliefs into in the Western world? They're putting it mostly into consumerism. They're putting it into politics. They're putting it into corporations, you know, movies, TV, politicians, uh, corporations. They are the idols of the Western culture today. And because they're not, it's not realistic. It's taking advantage of us personally. They fill our life with with things we think we want, but like you said, in the end, we have no meaning to our life if that's all we fill our life with is with these consumeristic products, and we don't really come face to face or terms with our mortality, which is what Tyler is constantly doing with the narrator in the film. He's trying to make him understand that at some point he's going to die. The two main scenes where he does that is the chemical burn with the lie when he kisses his hand. And then the other one is when he has the, is the car crash where he's just, just let go. So he's trying to have the narrator face the fact that I am, you are going to die. You are not special. God and most definitely probably didn't want you, doesn't like you. And it's up to you to kind of make something of your life on your own and not and not depend on this new consumerism society. Yeah, and I think that has tied into the modern society even more so in terms of these things ending up as a way of a distraction from life. And a lot of people don't contemplate the idea of life and death. And there's this great line in the movie where he sa- where Tyler says something along the lines of you're, you're getting cl- you're dying one second at a time. Like every second you're dying, you're getting closer to dying. And so, you know, it's a ticking clock essentially. It's hard it, that's a sh- crappy way to think about it, but 
you only have so much time. There's a finite amount of time in life. And uh, I think that Tyler's trying to teach the narrator that how do you want to spend your time? Do you want to spend your time uh, coddling to corp corporate daddy and doing what, you know, this a boss says, do, do what this boss says or do what this famous person tells you to do or try to be someone who you're not? Or do you want to spend your life living your true self and embracing who you really are. And again, we're not saying quit your job. We're just saying fill your life with meaning. Yeah. Unlike the narrator who has no meaning or purpose in his life, which is why he suffers from insomnia, which is why he creates Tyler Durden. Yeah, and he's lost his meaning because he's found himself lost and addicted to this corporate consumeristic materialistic lifestyle. And so throughout the film, Tyler and narrator are building Fight Club. Oh, I do. Well, actually, want, I actually, want, I want to talk about. Do you, would you like to talk about the idea of capitalism in this movie? Let's go back. Yeah, you're right. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves because I still want to talk about Marla Singer, and I also want to get into the therapy sessions and therapy groups. So first, yeah. you bring that up. Yeah. So I think that obviously capitalism is a major theme in this movie, and I think that this movie addresses it in a few ways. And I think the first way it it addresses it beautifully. And, and I think that this movie also takes a nuanced approach to capitalism. I think a lot of people when they look at this movie, they say. Capitalism is evil and capitalism is a horrible thing. I think that this film says th certain things like that, but it's not entirely like that. And so I, obviously the, the the bad part of capitalism in this film is addressed in terms of narrator uh, with his job. He works for a major company, a car company, a major car corporation, and his job is to um, visit crash sites and, and accident sites and determine whether a recall should be uh, made for certain car products. And there's this amazing scene where he tells the woman sitting next to him on the airplane that if the cost of a recall is too pricey, they don't do the recall, even if it means the risk of many people dying from this malfunction with the car part. And this is a real thing that happens. You know, corporations do terrible things to make as much money as possible and to save as much money as possible. Like, like L'Oreal just got blasted and they had to recall bunch of products because they were using a cheap chemical that was had horrible effects on people's skin and body just because it was a cheaper thing to put in the product and you know people companies testing products on animals uh employing cheap labor employing child labor across the world and employing close to slave labor across the world effects on the environment yeah the effects on the environment so corporations do horrible things when they are not regulated and when they are not overseen by government and corporate and capitalism gets out of control when the politicians we elect don't do anything to to regulate and try and control them. And so that's this is big mess. And I think that narrator's job is a great great way of illustrating the dangers of capitalism and major corporations. Yeah, and Tyler's an effect of the life that he leaves because of living in this consumerism world with no meaning, no purpose. And obviously Project Mayhem is a result of what happens when someone like that is pushed too far. But let's go back. And I want to I want to talk about narrator for a little bit. And I want to talk about in comparison him to Tyler, but also his therapy sessions and also Marla Singer. So Tyler and narrator are complete opposites. You know, you could say Tyler's a wolf, narrator's a sheep. Tyler's self-sufficient. He's got no boss, no bills. No social norms. He does whatever he wants. Yes, he has those odd jobs. So he technically he has an employer, but he takes advantage of them. You know, Tyler in the beginning of the film, he's taking baby steps towards his anarchist behavior and his, you could say, cult-like presence of being a leader. He's like just splicing in those frames into movies at the theater. He's peeing in, in soup at the, at the place. So it's not like Tyler started off as this anarchist mastermind. You know, it takes time for him to expand his thoughts. Same thing with as the more and more that he's growing inside narrator's mind because he's he, throughout the course of the film, Tyler's getting stronger and getting more of a life force, you could say, from narrator. You could say that narrator's probably sleeping more and more and thinks he's sleeping more and more and he's living more life as Tyler throughout the film as it progresses. Yeah, it's it's literally narrator versus, the, versus Tyler for control of the mind and body. And at first narrator has most of the control and that's why we just see flashes of Tyler here and there but by the by the third act when uh, Project Mayhem has disappeared from the house and Tyler is missing Tyler has probably been, been in control like 80 to 90 percent of the time and and narrator only gets control back because Tyler's job is done and there's no way to stop it so that's why I think Tyler lets narrator finally wake up after a long spell 
but it's an amazing battle of these two personalities and you could say these two souls in a way fighting for control of the mind yeah and tyler is everything that narrator is not he looks like he wants to look he f's like he wants to f he's smart he's capable he's also very dangerous but he's enticing and charming like i said that's why so many people flock to him but also like in terms of the way he looks tyler is a contradiction because he looks like it's brad pitt you know it's probably the most attractive man to ever star in movies you could say right and he dresses like he's super like super cool super fashionable designer clothes he's always got like amazing shoes on and so tyler is lit a literal contradiction of all these things that he talks about hating and wanting to rebel against and the reason why Tyler looks the way he does, like you said, is because it's the way narrator wants to look. And that's because of the way the media and advertising, movies, TV, music has made him think that he should look and made him think that that's how he wants to look. Well, kind of Tyler. Yeah, he wears like you could say like an expensive jacket, but his, his outfits are always very ruffled or maybe they don't match completely. Like he's wearing sweatpants with a leather jacket. He's kind of up in the air with what he wears. So I wouldn't say he's exactly put together like consumerism tells you to look. No, no, but I'm talking about he's wearing very expensive designer brand clothing. It's possible. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So see, so he's uh, literally a, a reflection of what, what narrator believes he should look like. And yeah. also that's why he attacks Jared Leto's character so viciously because he reminds him of what Tyler looks like. So in a way, Tyler looks like, narrator hates the image of Tyler in a way. And that's also why he attacks Jared Leto out of envy and jealousy because of the how similar he is to him. Well, it's at that point in the film, he does it because that's when Tyler is is kind of blocking narrator out of the plans of project mayhem he's very getting very upset he's feeling like he's about to be abandoned by tyler so that's why he's lashing out on blondie because yes he does remind him of tyler of, of course so he's taking out his anger and frustration with tyler out on blondie because remember as soon as project mayhem kind of starts getting formed when he starts handing out homework assignments narrator doesn't get any homework assignments narrator wasn't in on the smiley face in the building with the uh the paint and the eyes on fire and he's not even in with the with the the hotel dinner kidnapping scene he's not in on that he just sees everyone going to the bathroom so he's like i better go see what's going on so he's feeling like tyler's abandoning him and moving on but so that's one way to look at it but i think a really deeper way to look at it is so tyler embracing blondie is literally because it's narrator subconsciously embracing tyler which he hates and despises embracing looking so beautiful embracing looking so perfect so narrator as tyler sees himself in blondie exactly and that's why he destroys blondie's face because then he says the line i just wanted to destroy something beautiful so i think that it looks like it's driven by envy of tyler giving blondie attention but i think it's ultimately deeper if you think about it deep deeply because tyler is narrator narrator embrace blondie who is a representation of all these things he hates and so then he hates himself for that and so that's why he attacks Blondie. It's a pretty good assessment. I like it. <laughs> but we got to talk about Marla Singer, played by Helena Bonham Carter, who is just fantastic in this movie. And so the, I think what's so great about this film in the first act is that they make it seem like Marla's crazier than narrator. Even though narrator, he's, deal, he's got his insomnia in the only way... Because we don't know yet. Yeah, we don't know what he's really like. The only way he can sleep is going through these, these therapy sessions. He's going to... Uh, the help self-help groups for testicular cancer, parasites, uh, bloodworms, whatever it is. He's going to several a week. He's addicted to it because it's the only way that he can feel emotions, really. He can he can cry so he can sleep. So he's basically feeding off the grief and pain of other people because he can't feel either of those emotions. And that's where Marla Singer comes into play because even he's doing it but for— hold on, I'm sorry. Also because it's the only place where people actually listen to you. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And so— He's been doing it for about a year until Marla Singer comes. And Marla, her only reasoning for being there is because it's cheaper than a movie and they have free coffee. No, no, no. Because she's because no, because when when she's when Ty, when narrator says, um, well, yeah, it's, it's and they, they yeah, finally listen, listen to you. They it, they're there for the same reason. Yeah, I think. And that's what's so ironic about narrator's relationship with Marla is because he can't stand her. He looks at her as he calls her a tourist. And he thinks that she, she he he's like she's a liar. She doesn't belong here. But he's doing the exact same thing. Yeah, he sees himself in her. Exactly. So they are so similar 
And ironically, he can't see that. I think that also narrator suppresses. It could be he's obviously attracted to her, is interested in her. That's why he suggests they exchange numbers. There's no other reason, really, because he's not going to call her, even though he, he does after the plane crash. But he's he's not interested. Every time they have an interaction, he, he acts like he's disgusted. So maybe you could argue that maybe maybe he's impotent. Maybe he's unable to fulfill sexual desires. Maybe he has no more sexual desires at all, despite the fact that he's attracted to her. That's why he pushes her away constantly. Well, no, he has sexual desires because he la- he gets it out through Tyler. Well, but, so yeah, but, I'm talking about narrator though. Yeah, no, I'm saying so narrator. He has sexual desires, but it's expressed through narrator. But in terms of narrator, like you said, showing disgust whenever he's talking with Marla. And always rejecting her and not wanting not wanting anything to do with her, it's because it goes back to the the idea of him having no meaning or emotion in his life, and he has no compassion, so he doesn't know how to love someone because he doesn't love anything or love himself. And so this is a part where he's so numb that the idea of having an intimate relationship with someone emotionally seems horrible to him despite the fact how similar they are they're yeah. both like very nihilistic they both see no meaning in life really they're both suicidal marla tries to kill herself with taking all the medication and then even with narrator that crazy scene where he's flying he's in the plane banks and he's like every time a plane banks <laughs> left i just wish for i pray I for, pray a, for a, a mid-air collision and so he's suicidal and so isn't so isn't marla but you could say that marla she wants to die, maybe, but not as bad as they. They both want to die. No, they both. They, they both want. They both want to die, but they don't want to really do it themselves, and they're kind of upset that it hasn't happened yet. In a way, if that makes sense. Exactly. And the thing with Marla is, ultimately, this is a part where a good part of masculinity is learning compassion, learning to embrace intimacy, learning to be a good partner. You know, you know, having like, being in a, a strong relationship and. And that's something that he eventually is learning with because of Marla. Because he doesn't even know that they're in a relationship of some kind until the third act of the film. And then when he realizes this, then he's understanding, oh, I actually care about her. And I, I like her. And I want to make sure she's safe. Whereas if you go to him in the first act of the movie, he, he, repul- he was repulsed by her. You know what I mean? And so Marla is an intimate connection that helps grow him in a positive way to becoming uh to growing that humanity within him so she's vital to his development of rejecting tyler and rejecting the extreme nature of project mayhem now let's hit into our intermission i'll begin with the movie quote competition i have one from a fan and one from me this is from elijah hebert what if I were to say that it's not that I don't understand people, but that I don't like them? Oh, man, this sounds so familiar. He what said, if I was to say that it's not that I don't understand people, but that I don't like them? Some kind of sociopath. I can't think of it. <laughs> it is a sociopath. It's uh, Lou Bloom from Nightcrawler. Oh. oh, man. What a great quote. Yeah. And then, certainty of death. <laughs> I'm going to try to do a voice. Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? Oh, I know this. Are they Scottish saying it? He sounds like he's Scottish in the movie. <laughs> Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? It's Gimli. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Return, of the, Return of the King. Yeah. yeah. Nice job. Right before they go to uh, nice. the Black Gate. This guy, I'm telling you, he's pretty good, everybody. <laughs> All right, here's my quote. I don't know who's weirder, you or me. Oh, <laughs> uh, what is this? God, I don't know who's weirder, you or me. Oh my god! When you tell me, it's gonna piss me off. Cause uh, what movie is this? I don't know. Taxi Driver. Yeah, Jody Foster's yeah, character. When yeah. They're having uh, coffee and and uh, toast. That's a good one. Yeah. All right. Guess this movie release year. Twenty fifth hour. Spike Lee movie, super underrated. Okay, 25th Hour came out in, I want to say, 2003. Two. Ah! 2002. I knew it was close to 9-11. Classic. Yeah. Edward Norton, 
Philip R- Seymour Hoffman, Rosario Dawson, and then um, Barry Pepper. Barry Pepper, really good movie. Barry Pepper. All right. My movie release year is The Accused, starring Jodie Foster. 1989. 88. Ah, very close. Super wow. Close. Very close. All right. Movie pop quiz time. What's yours? Okay. What is the most successful movie of all time when adjusted for inflation? So it's not Avatar then. I don't know. It could be. Well, uh, would it be um? Would it be singing in the rain? Hey, you, you gotta like give me an answer. You can't ask me. If I'm it just. Would be t- this is how I. <laughs> this is how I work through answers in my head. I just talk to myself. Would it be singing in the rain? Would it be not Casablanca? I'm gonna go singing in the rain. Singing in the rain's not even close. Or no, it's uh, Avatar. No. <laughs> I don't know. Gone with the wind. Gone with the wind. That's what I was thinking of. Why is singing, singing in the rain? Is, is That's what I was thinking. But not that. Oh man, <laughs> my bad. So, Gone with the Wind sold 202 million tickets in America when it came out. That's a lot. To, I mean, what was the population when it came out? Not that much. <laughs> it's not as much as, as now. But and com- to compare that, Endgame, Avengers Endgame, sold 95 million tickets in America. So it sold more than twice as many tickets as Endgame. And when adjusted for inflation. Gone with the Wind earned three point seven billion dollars. Holy guacamole! Yep, big big movie. It's a it's a lot of cheddar cheese. I mean, although there were like twenty movies released that year, is the thing, and that's it. But still, biggest movie ever made. It will never be beaten. Avatar was what two point two billion. Two point seven so, was it that much? Well, because yeah. of the re release, you're right. Yeah. No, but it, yeah, it's almost three billion. But I mean, it's still. A billion away from Gone with the Wind. If there were as few movies put out per year like there were back then, it, it oh yeah, would probably there's, there's a reason why it made that much. Yeah. There's, there's a reason why it sold that many tickets. All right, biggest hate of the week. We got, we got a few. Oh, these are pretty good. So this was actually all on one clip. You posted a clip about Charlize Theron wearing prosthetic makeup for um, the film about the Fox News bombshell. Bombshell. And Matt Brazer wrote. Get a real job. And so I replied, this is a job. <laughs> we, we make money. <laughs> we and, don't do this for fun. Yeah. And then also, Tick789 wrote, why didn't they use the real anchor and save money? She's not an actor. <laughs> Megan Kelly's not an actor. <laughs> She's a news anchor. <laughs> and he said he called the the, produ- the filmmakers a confused bunch of potatoes. What? Like, who? She's not an actor. She, she is a news anchor. She's a journalist. I've never heard someone say, why don't they have the real person play themselves in the movie? That's the what? stupidest thing I ever heard. That's ridiculous. It's, it's like, why would you have Megyn Kelly act in a movie? She's not an actor. Unreal. It makes no sense. Yeah. Are you going to have George Bush like actually be play, in, play himself in movies? In the movie. <laughs> <laughs> better, better remake that movie, Adam McKay. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. And then also in the same clip, Mark Levine said, I knew there was some crazy makeup going on. She is not that gorgeous. Wow, that's and I'm mean. like, wow, Charlize Theron is not that gorgeous. Are you kidding me? The, is she, he said that about her with with the prosthetics on or off, saying that she's not as gorgeous as she is with the prosthetics on. What? Yeah, Charlize Theron, one of the most beautiful people alive. This guy, like Charlize Theron, like would he would be lucky if she even if she even looked in his direction. <laughs> <laughs> if, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna say what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Like, oh my God, Charlize Theron is not good enough for you, bro. Come on. And I, I can, I'm not going to say, but I can already tell from his thumbnail photo, she's way out of his league. Not even close. She's out of most people's league. And then if we have a couple of unsubscribed haters. So we have uh, <laughs> Ben Medi- Ben Madison corrected my um, uh, post when I said, you had us as Jake Gyllenhaal. I meant to say, you had us at Jake Gyllenhaal. Uh-huh. So he wrote, at Jake Gyllenhaal, actually, unsubscribed. You've been making a lot of typos on social media. I had to correct a couple, and you did your and your mistake yesterday. I'm not good with smartphone texting. <laughs> he's used to T9, everybody. He's, he's just got his smartphone. <laughs> it's hard to write. Yeah, and I then, mean, autocorrect, yeah. Yeah, and then Citywood wrote, unsubscribed only from Anthony, even though James <laughs> is the Tesla replica. And then I said, I don't need any of you. Always subscribed. <laughs> and then Citywood uh, resubscribed. So we love you, Citywood. 
All right, I I have two biggest supporters of the week. These are excellent five star reviews. The first is from E Sims Eight, Massachusetts for the win. My favorite podcast. I'm a production assistant and film student from Massachusetts. Every is the last podcast. Answered my podcast prayers. I listen to you guys driving to the Cape to to wear a Hanover. No, <laughs> where are you going to Falmouth <laughs> to visit my mom in the hour forty five miles? And the hour forty five flies by. Whether it's an actor profile or a series like Harry Potter, the topics are consistently interesting, and I get excited every week. Your classic Boston banter makes me feel like I'm in the room with you and removes my pretension that film podcasts usually have. Remo- removes any pretension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been great to see you grow and the quality improve. Won't be unsubscribed That's anytime a wicked, soon. That's a wicked pistol review guy. P.S. Go Sox, maybe do a baseball episode. If we make it to the series, please don't leave out Fever Pitch. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, yeah, if we make it to the World Series, yeah. Thanks, bud. And then Jason Vowles, love it. Got called out as a biggest hater of the week, but that's all right. <laughs> I just unsubscribed, then resubscribed right after. I always like movies, but now it's on a whole new level. Even started coming up with my own ideas for movies. Learned more than I ever thought I would. And with these two, you feel like you're best buds with them anyways. Aww. Wow, that thanks, Jason. We really appreciate you're that. You're our bud, too. You're not really our, a hater. We, we we just play yeah, around. Yeah, he does. He yeah. does. Yeah, so wow, that's so cool that we're inspiring you to come up with film ideas. That's awesome. Love the reviews. On this day in film history, today is September 16th. In 1953, the first movie in Cinemascope, a.k.a. widescreen format, was released. It was The Road. In 1983, Arnold Schwarzenegger becomes a U.S. citizen. In 2011, Drive premiered, the film by Nicholas Winning Refn. Phenomenal movie. And happy birthday to Amy Poehler and Mickey Rourke. Do you want to tell our audience about your new TikTok channel? Oh, yeah, I got a new TikTok account. It's called On This Day in Film. So I did a TikTok account exclusively on this entire segment that I do on the show. And every day is a different date, and I talk about and of what happened that day in film. It's pretty cool. It's a great channel. He makes he edits these great videos together. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's fun. You know, I think the quality is great. And then you you have your own TikTok account too. Yeah. So I started another TikTok channel called Art House Cinema Reviews, and now on the Art House Cinema Reviews account, I just review and talk about art house films, meaning small independent artsy movies from America, and also the entire filmography of international film. So I'll talk about anything from like. A movie that was made in the 60s in America to something that was made in France in like the 70s. So it's all about discussing movies that aren't mainstream, movies that don't have superheroes in them, movies that don't have big box office. Wait, you haven't done Winter Soldier yet? <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> I, I haven't done WandaVision yet. So it's all about expanding and, and talking about movies that never get talked about on these platforms. And my streaming recommendation today is... Escape from Alcatraz on Amazon Prime, my favorite prison escape movie. I think that, you know, this walk so that Shawshank Redemption could run. It's an amazing performance from Clint Eastwood. Um, excellent directing all around. Every prison movie has taken influence from this film. Great, great movie. Great pick. My streaming recommendation is Hard Eight on Amazon Prime. This is Paul Thomas Anderson's debut film. Stars... John C. Riley, Philip Baker Hall, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Samuel Jackson. Excellent, excellent dark drama. All right, should we get back into Fight Club? Oh, man, we just got started. Let's go. Yeah, and so we were talking about Marla in the narrator and how they're similar. You know, they're also similar in terms of self-destruction, which is a major theme for Tyler Durden because he says that line on the bus that we mentioned where self-improvement is masturbation, but self-destruction is... That's something that Tyler's very interested in. And you could say that self-destruction is represented throughout the film all over the place. Obviously, the idea of Fight Club, you know, destroying your own yourself, destroying your, your body, your face, you know, was the narrative say? He says, once you learn you're, you're not made out of glass, you're kind of curious to see what you can do. It's, it's very similar to there's a, a the movie Green Street Hooligans. Mm-hmm. A very similar line that Elijah Wood's character says in the same thing. It's the, the kind of philosophy of like getting in fights on purpose. How much can you know about yourself if you've never been in a fight? Yeah. I don't. Do you want to die without any scars? No. I got some scars. You gave me a couple. I gave you a few. This, yeah. It's what it Not like you want to yeah, fight, yeah, yeah. though. So I have... Okay, <laughs> hold on. Real quick. Oh, no, we don't have to, we don't have to get into it. You need a fight. What happened was... <laughs> He threw a, Fake a news. Ch- he threw a chunk of tar at my eye, <laughs> so I have I got seven I got eighteen stitches in my eyebrow. I didn't you, the way you say it like that means like I wanted to kill you. I didn't want to. I wasn't Hon, trying Hon, to kill you. Did you throw a chunk of tar? I threw a did chunk of tar. Uh, 
I was throwing. First of all, I wasn't aiming at you. I was aiming at a tree. We were that's throwing. What, that's what we think. We were. We were <laughs> at. It was at Nipamar Park in Waltham. Nipamar. Nipamar Park in the baseball <laughs> field. Someone was. One of our brothers was playing a game, and we were. Me, you, and some other kid we were just chucking rocks off a tree, and then you ran right in front of it when I was throwing at the same time. I did not like. <laughs> Aim at Anthony and say, oh, he's really pissing me off today. My six-year-old self wants to murder my brother. Oh, yeah. So, no, yeah. I, I was just being funny. I, what really happened was I thought I could pass him before he got the throw out. This is the first time you've taken a admittance of guilt for I've the situation. Said that. I've said that. I've before. never heard I've you, told you that. I've never heard that. No, yeah. I thought I could get through. I could. I thought I could pass you fast enough. You tell that to mom. I still think she holds it against me. No, nah, you didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> but I was covered in blood. There's a lot of blood. <laughs> Thank God there was an emergency right across the field. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there was a emergency room like yeah. like a two minute walk away. Yeah, was, you were good. You were fine. A couple of stitches, snip, snap, snip, snap. You're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know how the total four is affecting these has about a person? <laughs> snip, snip, snap, snip, snap. snap. <laughs> Dinner party, best episode of the office. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, so I have some scars. You never got stitches or anything though. I've had fake stitches because I, that's I not, <laughs> fake stitches is not stitches. not not the real stitches. My skin's pretty tough, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, you have like a rhinoceros hide. You could take a saw to this thing. It's not getting through. All right, we got a saw back here. And we don't have to do it right now. <laughs> All right, I'm just saying. It's we, probably we too. It's it. probably too dull. We can get video evidence of this tough skin of yours. There's no point. It's too dull. It's, <laughs> it's too even, dull. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be a futile test. Anyways, speaking of self-destruction, <laughs> a major theme in the film, again, not just with Fight Club, but also of a person emotionally for the narrator, self-destruction in terms of leaving his past self and his his loathsome, loathsome being in, in life and existence of this meaningless person who's stuck inside of his Ikea apartment. He's, self de he's destroying that person to become who he is at the end of the film. And you could say it culminates when he puts the gun in his mouth and he finally pulls the trigger, destroying Tyler Durden. And also, being in, being in Fight Club in... Getting his butt beat and and fighting other men and you know getting covered being covered in bruises and his mouth is like always bleeding, it frees him in terms of especially at his workplace because he says this line, um, it, when he's narrating about other people in his work office saying it yes these are bruises from fighting yes I am comfortable with that once he begins Fight Club. The way he views his people, the others at work, is in like he's in this power situation. Like he's better than all of them. Like I know a secret that you don't know about life. You know I'm really living life, and you're all just a couple of worker bees still working in the hive. He's enlightened, exactly. So it changes his his mindset and his perspective on the world. And just like how he says when they get on the bus, every time we went somewhere, we started sizing things up and sizing people up. So there, he's looking at people in a new way and looking at everything in a new way. And why does Fight Club keep growing? Because it, at first it starts off as another one of those self-help groups that the narrator was going to in the beginning of the film to help him sleep, to help him feel emotions, to help him cry. You know, you could say that Fight Club was fulfilling the same purpose. Yes, he was more confident, you could say, and he was having these new feelings that we've just been talking about, about how he feels about other people, about the world around him. But still, it was just a self-help club for men, you could say, at the end of the day. If it never grew from fighting in the basement of Lou's Tavern, that's all it really was. But it grows exponentially because it's not enough. You know, the narrator is still clinging to that past because he's, Tyler still exists. And... Even the scene with the chemical burn that we brought up earlier, when Tyler starts the process of the chemical burn, narrator tries to go into his happy place to find his power animal, to hide from the pain, hide from the emotion, hide from the mortality of his life and the inevitability of death. So he's still clinging to the past. That's why Fight Club has to keep growing because Tyler is trying to, you could say, take over control of the body, but also you could say narrator's trying to free himself from his past. I got something to throw down on this. Dude, throw down. Let's go. Okay, so the entire idea of Fight Club is the ultimate irony of the movie because what does Fight Club become? An an anarchist terrorist group? Becomes a franchise. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It becomes an in a, a national franchise. So Tyler, narrator, while he's sleeping, Tyler sets up franchises, he says, all over the country of Fight Clubs. What he does is he's 
corporately expanding the club. They have corporate sponsorships. Exactly. And so what happened, the irony of the irony of Fight Club and the irony of Project Mayhem is it becomes a corporation. So what happens is they take all these men who have been disillusioned by the world, they become worker bees and sheep and they've lost meaning in their lives and they bring them to Project Mayhem. And at first Fight Club sets them free, but once they join Project Mayhem, what happens? They get their heads shaved and they dress all in black. They lose their identities again. And so just like how they were meaningless, lack of identity individuals in Western civilization, they become the same exact thing, worker bees, people without meaning and without individuality as members of Project Mayhem. So ironically, Fight Club becomes a corporation. Well, not just a corporation. Fight Club becomes conformity. Yeah. You know, they're so anti-conformity. That's the whole point of Tyler. Not conforming to the social hierarchies, not conforming to the way the world tells you to be, avoiding the the sheep-like mentality, avoiding the herds, being yourself. And then, like you said, you go to Fight Club, you basically pledge to be in Fight Club, and you conform there as well. So it's another system of conformity. And it's basically... You're trading in one ideology for another ideology. And what I like about it, though, is that it's not masking or hiding what it is specifically with what Tyler calls his cult members. You could say the members of Project Mayhem. What's he call them? Human sacrifices. That's what he calls them. The space monkeys ready to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Um, even on the back of his door inside his room, he has a photo of each of them or he has their IDs. And the top of it is labeled human sacrifices. That's the way corporations view us. We're basically human sacrifices to them to keep the wheel going, to, t- to keep the money funneling in to their pockets. That's all it is. And that's basically what Fight Club is, what Project Mayhem becomes. But it's just not hidden it's just open to us to see yeah but isn't fight isn't project mayhem worse because they don't even have names anymore like they have been completely stripped of their identity where they don't even have a name anymore well well the world that this film takes place in narrator doesn't have a name that's true no identity yeah who is he yeah marla has a name but i mean everyone else does though He's but the still only one. they're still endless in the film they're mindless sheep yeah. you know the characters even all the people at work they have names they have jobs but that doesn't mean that they're as in the, they're more of an individual than the members of Project Mayhem. Yeah, but I would I would argue that the conformity into Project Mayhem has completely erased any la- any small amount of individuality that any of those members had. Well, a member in Project Mayhem <laughs> has a name in, in death. death. His, His name, name was Robert, Robert Paulson. Paulson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we've, we've seen this movie a few times. <laughs> I want to talk about, just for a little bit, about the clues leading up to the big twist. And now... We all know narrator is Tyler, and he created Wait, what? <laughs> and he created Tyler to as as a uh, like we talked about earlier. Now a vehicle there, to change his life. Yeah, exactly. I, I lost my words for it. Now there there are obvious clues that everyone picks up on right away to Tyler. So obviously the first ones are the flashes of Tyler on screen in the first act. You know those couple of frames here and there. It happens in the hospital. It happens at the the meeting, a couple of frames of at him. the office. Yeah, at the office, and then also he and Tyler have the same briefcase when they're on the plane. And then I think obviously a big one is that Tyler knows how to make homemade explosives, which he tells us right before Narrator's apartment explodes. You know, so those are definitely not very subtle clues. Now there are also a lot of very subtle clues leading up to the reveal, and I made a list of them that I think are really fantastic, and and you probably don't see most of these your first or second viewings but upon repeat viewings you eventually see all of them it's really great so the subtle clues to tyler being the narrator are bob thanking the narrator for fight club after they go to the same night and he's like hugging narrator he's like thank you for this thank you thank you he doesn't call him tyler but he's thanking narrator so intensely and then tyler is and then the rumors about tyler people say have you heard he only sleeps one hour a day So that means that narrator has to be Tyler because Tyler works at night with all these odd jobs while narrator can't sleep at night. So clearly narrator is Tyler working these odd jobs. Now at the phone booth when narrator calls Tyler and he doesn't pick up and then then Tyler calls him back on the phone booth, there's actually a sign on the phone booth that says no incoming calls. So it's impossible to receive a phone call at that phone booth. And then after the car crash, after the accident, narrator climbs out of the driver's side of the car even though he was sitting 
what he thought, what we think was in the passenger seat. And then usually when characters speak to Tyler, now this pretty much always happens the first time they speak to nar- to Tyler, narrator is always in the same shot, whether it be in the background or in the foreground. Like he's in the foreground at the, the, the beauty soap shop and he's in the background when Lou's talking to Tyler. You can see narrator in the background. So when the, a, a character first speaks to Tyler, narrator is always visible on screen as well for the first shot. And then, obviously, when narrator beats himself up in his boss's office, he, th- he thinks about, it reminds him of his first fight with Tyler. That might be a little bit more of an obvious one. When discussing their fathers, they both have the exact same story of calling their dad on the phone and asking him what to do next. Um, fight clubs keep popping up all around the country. This obviously ties to narrator's job flying around the country for his work. So clearly, whenever he goes to do a recall check, he's setting up a new fight club in that city. Also, when Lou beats the crap out of Tyler, the first time he punches Tyler is right in the stomach. Now, in this, this there's a wide shot of this. So Lou punches Tyler, and in the background, narrator who's leaning against the wall, he literally winces and drops his head as though he got punched in the stomach. You get to rewind it and watch this. It clearly looks like he also got punched. So he's feeling Tyler's pain, and then obviously he always says he sometimes says sometimes Tyler speaks for me. And then Marla recognizes Tyler Durden when he shows up to stop her from killing herself. She doesn't say, "Who are you? I don't know what you look. I don't know who you are." She clearly knows that. She clearly knows this person, so it has to be narrator who showed up at her apartment. She just says, "Did I call you?" Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, but then she said, "You got here fast." So yeah. clearly, she knows it's narrator. And then also, when Tyler and narrator get on the bus. Tyler's the only one who pays a, f- a fare for the bus, so they only pay one bus fare for two people. Oh yeah, you're right. He slams it in. Yeah. Wow, that's a great list. Thanks, man. I kind of want to look up some some a lot of those I knew, but like you gotta do the loop the wincing one. one I yeah. didn't I didn't know about Watch that. Watch it. You're gonna be like, oh my god, holy crap. It's obvious. That's what that's what we mean by David Fincher being a genius director. Things like that. That I I've seen this movie twenty times at least, and I still haven't. I never noticed that attention to detail. It's incredible, and you know, obviously, pain is and violence are prevalent in this film you know there's a lot of violence a lot of fighting you know this movie isn't promoting fighting but what i think it's promoting or describing is accepting pain into your life because it's a part of life we have to we suffer life is suffering life is suffering you grow when you suffer you know if you just spend your entire life, you know, coddled and, and hidden from pain and sheltered from it, it's, it's like how we were talking earlier. We're living in a society that's that's hiding us from the inevitability that we're going to die someday. And when people, I think that it's going to have an effect on people that they don't think about that. And then they're going to be old one day. They're going to be like, holy crap, I'm going to die someday. And it, who knows what's going to take, what kind of effect it's going to have on them mentally because I'm going to be covered in wrinkles and I'm, I'm going to be old. Yeah, yeah. Our, our parents' generation, they grew up, you know, in the society that because like we talked about earlier with the lack of religion and spirituality and, and things to actually put your faith in that are worth it, not that saying that everyone should be religious or anything. You but it's, you it's a form of finding meaning. Yeah, it's a yeah, form of finding meaning, but also a form of finding meaning in death after life. You know, we don't have that anymore. Like a lot of people just aren't religious anymore. They, they're not spiritual. And like we said, they turn to consumerism and goods. They turn to politicians Nihilism. For, for their faith. And that's what they put their faith in. But that's not something to really depend on for the rest of your life. That's and a great point. To think, and again, we're not, we don't embrace our mortality like, Every generation of humans did before this current state of West postmodern sin- and Western culture. You know, this is the first time ever that, as a mass of society, that religion, spirituality, wherever you want to believe and call it, didn't dominate beliefs and we didn't address mortality. And I think that's why people are so akin to escape reality, to be distracted on their phone or, or to always just not be thinking about the inevitability of death because. A part of this movie, getting back to the the fighting, why fighting? Why the physicality? Why aggression? Why why feeling pain? Because it's a form of discomfort, you know. In Western civilization, at this point in the film, you know, comfort for most, for generally speaking, people live very comfortable lives compared to the majority of the world. People, especially in like Western Europe and America and Canada, live extremely comfortable lives. Like we have it very lucky. And most of us take it for granted, but also 
we are not used to discomfort. We don't like discomfort. And so we try to avoid discomfort. We, so we're always looking to coddle ourselves. We're always looking to make us always feel good about ourselves, feel good about everything around us. And we avoid discomfort. We avoid things that are scary to think about. We avoid things that are difficult to embrace. We avoid, you know, challenges. We, we avoid sacrifice. We avoid the idea of willingly sa suffering in the small term to, you know, find success in the long term. So we, we're looking to take the easy route rather than the hard, long journey. And so this movie is showing that it's important to suffer. Like you said, life is suffering. It's important to feel pain and to feel discomfort and to, to feel crappy sometimes. And also it's important to, you know, work hard at something meaningful to you. And also to, you know, it sucks to, to work sometimes for a few years, but ultimately sacrificing your time and your comfort working towards a real goal that you have meaning in can be fulfilling by the long by the end of the road yeah and i can it tell can you really define your life i can tell you by personal experience that anthony and i anthony and i anthony and i <laughs> can't talk right now have put in 100 plus hours a week for the last year and a half on this show that's what we've done every week that don't have social lives we've sacrificed a lot of our time because you know i i justified that like i wasted a lot of time in my 20s so now i'm going to actually work very hard at something so that i can have a, a long-term positive effect financially uh emotionally creatively creatively with this project and rather than you know just having a boss just having a boss and working a day job for the rest of my life or or you know working my video production job forever you know and i think that a lot of people are afraid to do that in our society kind of demeans hard work today that it demeans it's not society it's culture that demeans the idea of hard work and sacrifice yeah be because the only way you really achieve goals is through hard work through discipline through suffering through pain through sacrifice that's a lot of what we're talking about in this film and and I, I think this conversation right now reminds me of the scene where the first time that Tyler and narrator, the second time they meet, so after the explosion of the when apartment, they get beard. and they get beer together, and, and narrator's talking about how he lost everything in his apartment and, and everything like that, and all my stuff I had, I had a respectable wardrobe, you know, I, that was the last sofa I was going to buy for a while, I was all set with that, you know. Um, and Tyler's like kind of just sitting there like this guy is ridiculous. He's complaining over all this stuff, which yes, it's a tragedy. It's terrible. You know, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but in terms of humans and human nature, the hunter gatherer sense of the word of what people are, what human beings actually are. Does it, does any of that matter to, to humans, to what we really are deep down? And are we really just hiding from that, hiding from the true nature of humans? It's all new. You know, all this stuff is brand new to human civilization. Globalized you know I mean? commuter consumerism. Yeah, exactly. It's it's not like this is a normal thing. Like you said, it's not natural for us. You know what I mean? It's natural. You know, we're sentient beings. We have intelligence, and it, it's it's important to find meaning. And I think that ultimately, if you don't have meaning in your life, or, or you're not working towards finding meaning, or you're not doing something that is meaningful to you. You're going to fall into nihilism just like those in this movie. You're going to fall into cynicism. You're going to hate the world. And also, you're going to be like stuck in your own kind of hell. Just like the worker bees in that office. They're just stuck there because they did not embrace who they are and find meaning. They just got a job. They just went to college because that's what society tells you to do. Society told me to you know, go to this college and get this degree and then work for this company in a cubicle for 30 years and then retire at 65 and then I guess I'll find meaning. That's not the way you should approach life. You should approach life by finding what suits you, what you're drawn to, and what you end up becoming passionate about and using that as a way of fulfilling yourself. And yeah. so I think the movie has really deep themes about finding meaning. Yeah, for the fourth time, Tyler and Fight Club and Fincher and Polnick, they're not telling you to quit your job. They're not telling you to tell your boss to go F himself. They're not telling you to just live in an abandoned house in the middle <laughs> of downtown around all these chemical waste plants that no one wants to go near. They're not telling you to burn buildings down. They're not telling you to start fight clubs. What the One of the main themes that they're, things that they're telling you to is, again, live an authentic life to what makes you happy, puts meaning into your life. Same thing with in the metaphor or the the scene with the veterinarian potential guy. That's the, That's what they're trying to tell you. And um, I want to talk about the final goal of Project Mayhem of blowing up the buildings of these credit card companies. 
Now, this perfectly ties into the philosophy of what Tyler talks about in terms of consumerism and how it affects us. So there's a great line. One sec. Let me scroll to it. Scroll, scroll, okay. scroll. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. So this refers to, you know, buying products using credit cards. Now, why there's really ultimately there's no reason to have a credit card. Well, there is. But... Well, all, so all, obviously to build credit so you can buy a car, buy a house. But ultimately that kind of is a silly notion. I, I think that if you have proof of income, that should be enough to buy something. I think that this whole system was set up of needing a proof of credit as a way of getting people to use credit cards. And credit cards are a dangerous thing for people, especially young people. They don't teach you about credit in school. They don't teach you about interest rates. All you do is you, you become an adult and you get credit cards and you start buying stuff. There's a reason why on your 18th birthday that week you start getting credit cards in the mail. Yeah. And now, credit, why do banks give out credit cards? Because they make a lot of money off of them. And this is the whole point of the movie of the second part, another part of corporate culture of corporations just making money off of people for the decisions they make to want to buy things with, with money they don't have. So they're essentially, yeah, they're loaning you money, but say you have $10,000 in credit card debt that you can't pay off, you're going to be paying off interest rate up the wazoo for years. That could ultimately turn into like you're ending up shelling out $50,000 to a bank over 10 years. So it's, it's a scary part of society, these banks and these corporations controlling our money by pretending to be our friends, like, here's free money, but then you're going to pay us several times that amount. They're not being good guys. They're not doing it just to be good guys. Exactly. So there is a moral high ground in terms of the plan of wanting to blow up these major credit card company buildings because of how negatively they do affect society. Yeah. And they are driven by... Consumerism, materialism. It's probably the worst of, in all the countries, it's probably the worst in America because not even just credit cards, but when you talk about student loans and yeah. and that fiasco, and like, I, I can attest that it took me a long time to pay off my student loans, but I was fortunate enough to, I didn't go to a very expensive university and I did get financial aid from the school when I went because of my grades and everything. Because you're wicked smart. <laughs> wicked smart kid. <laughs> so it, I wasn't, it wasn't crazy, but I was still like 20,000 in debt when I left college, you know, that's absurd to be 21, don't have a job. And I'm lucky with having only $20,000 in debt, something like that. But like some people, they're going to school with, and they have $150,000 in debt because of student loans. They're like, yes, but be, because I think that, you know, a lot of teenagers, they're, they're not educated, like you said, on credit cards or with student loans. They don't understand, like, you're going to have to pay this off. Like, no one's told you this. And they've just said, hey, click this button. You'll go to college for four years and we'll take care of the bill for four years. You don't have to and you don't have to pay anything until you leave. But that so that exactly is part of the problem of the society pressure and expectation to, oh, I'm OK. This, this school cost me 200 K for four years but I'm gonna get an awesome job because I have this great degree that I was told to get. But guess what? Then I graduate and I can't get that job. So then I have to get a low paying job um, doing something like, I don't know, labor or working in a restaurant. I've worked in restaurants or working in retail. And then I'm making 18,000 a year and I have to pay off a loan that costs almost that much. And so society kind of sets you up to fail where saying they set up these expectations that young people think they have to meet but then they do the expectations and they're trapped, especially with debt is a big problem with young people being trapped in huge amounts of debt that they weren't prepared for and fully mentally didn't really maturely understand like $200,000. I think a lot of people when they get, when they go to school and they like say, say the school is $200,000. I think a lot of people view that as, okay, I can pay off $200,000 over a couple of decades, but that's going to balloon to about 300,000, maybe even more over a few years. So you're paying off much more than what the student loan actually is. Yeah, so let's not get too much off yeah, topic sorry. of the film, but this all relates to the characters in the film who are, again, rejected by society and they've failed to meet these ex expectations of this consumeristic society, like we talked about earlier, where you're gonna be rich and famous, you're gonna be a movie star, um, you, you have to get a job, you have to go to college. So the, like this middle children of history is such a great metaphor for this generation of like post baby boom, that the, the kids of the baby, post baby boom, and then the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and what it's like growing up now and how 
drastically different it is and how it's getting even worse and worse when it comes to consumerism and the establishment and basically being controlled by algorithms now. And also, I think part of, part of the identity crisis addressed in this movie is this these lines that, like, when Tyler is speaking through the megaphone to the members of Project Mayhem, he's like, you are not a beautiful butterfly, you are not important, like, and then he says, like, in all, in all actuality, God probably, God doesn't like you, he probably hates you, he probably never wanted you, you're not special. And so I think what they're addressing in this movie is that uh, Western society, over the last several decades, the general population, people tend to think that, you know, they're super special in their own little universe. And that's why they're so dissatisfied with their lives if they don't do anything great with it because they have ex they, expectations that put onto themselves where they kind of think in a conceited way that, oh, I'm amazing, I'm so cool, I'm me. But ultimately, there are billions of people in the world and you're just like a little speck in the universe. So you're not that, nobody's that important. We're all just people living life, going through the motions. And so I think this movie, what they're saying is, it's important not to think too highly of yourself and to not think that you're better than anyone else. Because if you think that you you deserve the world, when you don't get everything, it makes you feel uh, small and meaningless. And, and meaningless. And you start a fight club. Exactly. At Loose Tavern. Yeah. So that's, I think, a part of the identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty absurd. Mayhem, I doubt it. I think that now that he's awake, he's probably just going to try to fill, find a way to live a life that fills him with meaning. And I think that following his relationship now with Marla Singer is going to give him that. So I think he's just going to focus on that relationship with her. I think that he will still keep the organization, but it's not going to be Project Mayhem anymore. I think that he will try and find a middle ground between, uh, you know, rebelling against conformity and rebelling against what society wants you to do and embracing individuality for these men involved in the, in the club. And also, I'm sure that I bet he would want to include women in the club as well and start, you know, a more peaceful movement built around meaning and, and identity and individuality. So I think that he will actually expand it and improve upon it and make it much more of a positive thing. Yeah. Now that he has, has awoken, now that he understands the problems that Project Mayhem created, and also now that he has a, a relationship with a, a person he cares about, he'll want to infuse that in the club as well. Yeah, I think Marla is the key to that whole entire thing, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why he awakens at the end. Well, I mean, he says this all started because of a girl named Marla. Yeah. So. And I have a question for you. Why do you think Tyler transforms? So obviously throughout the course of the film, he has the long hair and he has that same look. But then at the end of the film, when we finally have the great reveal in the hotel room that Tyler and the narrator are the same person, he has the buzz cut now. And he also has a chipped tooth at this point. So I believe Tyler has a shaved head because it is a, it's a representation of Project Mayhem's victory. Of And that's why, like I said earlier, that's why he lets narrator wake up and like discover everything because the plan is already done. There's no way to stop him. And now he is fully formed as Tyler. And I think that that is the final version of Tyler because he's erased that cool hair and he's embraced. Project Mayhem is like who he is represented in physical form. And so that's why he has a shaved head, because the members of Project Mayhem have to have shaved heads. Yeah, Tyler goes through a huge transformation. You know, like I said earlier, he's like begins as like a prankster, amateur anarchist, but then he turns into this terrorist group mastermind, you know, creating actual mayhem around the streets of, of the city and then, you know, destroying several skyscrapers at the end of the film. It's insane. Yeah. So ultimately Project Mayhem won. So I think that's why he has a shaved head. That's pretty pretty good answer. I like that. Thanks, man. I yeah. wasn't expecting that question. Did you, know, did you know Brad Pitt actually chipped his tooth for this? Oh, really? He went to a dentist. So this is when he noticeably Tyler has a chipped tooth, not the beginning of the film, but as Fight Club goes on, he transforms later on his character. He has a chipped tooth, so Brad Pitt went to a dentist and had his chipped tooth for filming. Nice. Good so, for him. Pretty wild. Some Daniel Day-Lewis commitment. I think he understood how important this part was going to be, how big it was. Yeah. All right, what else we got? Fun facts? Um, yeah, let's get into some fun facts because I'm sure we're missing some stuff, but there's just so much to talk about in this movie. And I, I like the way we approached it. In this yeah, episode. I think we did a good job. 
But well, I just love the ending, the third act, when you know he finds out who he is really, and then he tries to stop the skyscrapers from going down. He's like, "No, you're firing bullets at your imaginary friend in front of 400 gallons of nitroglycerin." <laughs> <laughs> and the fight between him again and Tyler, even though he, kn- it's interesting because he knows Tyler is him. He knows he's Tyler, and he's. He still getting his ass it. kicked by Tyler. He he's can't still, control it. Yeah, he's aware of it, but he can't control it. It's not until he's in the chair and he, he manages to get the gun, then he learns a way of controlling it in some way. Yeah, so shooting himself is his way of destroying Tyler. Yeah, exactly. Brad Pitt says he did not want his parents to see this movie, but he could not convince them not to watch it. They changed their minds after watching the chemical burn scene. And one of the lines of dialogue in the film where after Tyler and Marla have sex for the first time, and she screams out, I haven't been F like that from grade school. That was actually changed from the book. It was supposed to be something like, I want to I, I want to have, have your abortion. abortion. And so Brad Pitt really was adamant of trying to get that line cut, and they went through dozens and dozens of other lines to try to use. And Fincher actually came up with that new line, I haven't been F like that since grade school, to replace the abortion line. And he's like, my parents are seeing this movie. My parents are going to watch this movie. I don't want my mom to see me say that line. And then ironically, the studio even thought that was worse. So they're like, can you change it, to, can you change it back to the abortion line? But then they settled on the uh, grade school line. When the narrator hits Tyler Durden in the ear, you hit me in the ear. Edward Norton actually did hit Brad Pitt in the ear. He originally was going to fake hit him, but before the scene, David Fincher pulled Norton aside and told him to hit him in the ear. After Norton hit him in the hit, after Norton hit him in the scene, you can see him smiling and laughing while Pitt is in pain. When the narrator goes into his cave to find his safe, happy place, the visible breath in the cave is recycled. Breath from Leonardo DiCaprio characters Jack in Titanic, which Fincher and the filmmakers composited into the shot. It was made by um, Industrial Light and Magic, did it. David Fincher actually created his own marketing campaign for the film and made his own trailer, but Sony rejected it and went for a traditional trailer. But his trailer was supposed to be very surrealist and very uh, weird, but they hated it. Maybe it would have worked better. Tyler Durden was originally going to recite a workable recipe for homemade explosives in the film as he does in the novel. But in the interest of public safety, safety, the filmmakers decided to substitute fictional recipes for the real ones. That was actually smart of them. Brad Pitt actually wasn't interested in making this film until David Fincher arrived on his doorstep during the filming of Meet Joe Black in 1998, insisting that they go for a beer. It was over that beer that Fincher pitched Fight Club to Pitt, who agreed to take the role. Yeah, he needed this movie after Meet Joe Black. The sex scene between Tyler and Marla, you know, it's very, like, fluid and, like, distorted. That was shot using the same bullet time technique used in The Matrix. Still cameras were set up in a circle around the bed, and each one would take a single shot in sequence. These single frames were then edited together and enhanced with CGI, as both Pitt and Helena Bonham Carter were fully clothed in motion capture suits and during the shoot. Want to do some superlatives? Let's do it, man. Okay. Who is your MVP? David Fincher. Same here. Yeah, it's probably... Arguably his best movie. Yeah. That or Seven or, I mean, it's a, it's a phenomenally well-made movie. Social Network. Yeah. Okay, who is the best actor? I'm giving it to Edward Norton. Nice. I'm giving it to Brad Pitt. Nice. nice. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best shot? I think the final shot when Marla and narrator are holding, well, Nar- Mar- Marla and Tyler are holding hands and the buildings Ooh, yeah. explode all around them outside the windows and the pixies start playing. I think it's the best shot. My favorite shot is Marla smoking in slow motion Ooh, when we're one. learning about her. It's really good I think one. it's cool. What's the best line? The things you own end up owning you. Nice pick. I picked we don't buy we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Best scene? Oh, I, hold on. You do yours. <laughs> oh. <laughs> best scene. I'm the guy who does his job. Who are you? You hey, must you, be. You didn't have a quiz you question. Must... Shh. No one knows that. I think the best scene for me is the hotel room when narrator realizes he's Tyler because the first time I saw that as like a nine, ten year old kid, I was absolutely blown away because you know I wasn't really that. I wasn't aware or I wasn't really picking up on the vibe really that they were the same person. And when that happened, I was like, oh my god. 
that's a good pick. And it's just a, it's coming to full circle with the characters. You know what? I would say my favorite scene has got to be the opening scene because it's so unique, it's so original, and it's so intriguing because it, the first shot we see is the the pistol in narrator's mouth. And then he and Tyler say a couple of words, but then the narrator says, uh, he says, I got to back it up and start earlier. So right away we get this fourth wall kind of break, the narration cool style but an amazing start to the movie yeah i actually love the opening credits too because we're like we're in on like organisms or on bacteria and then we're slowly coming out and we find out that we're we were inside his, we're on his surface of his face yeah we were like yeah. inside his body we we're yeah. inside of his organism inside bacteria when we come out yeah i think it's just a fantastic opener to the movie yeah the fourth wall breaks are fantastic i can't believe we even talk about that and then also um oh what was i just about to say i don't know the fourth wall breaks, but the narration as well, because what I like about the first act of the narration, like you said, is he's like, let me go back. And he starts talking about his past, but then he's like, I have to go back even further. So yeah. it's kind of like bouncing around timelines with narration. And it's he's constantly talking in past tense. And it's, it's so similar to how people tell stories in real life. We're like, oh, this happened to me today. But actually, before that, this happened first, and then this and that. Yeah. So I think it's realistic to how we talk. Yeah. And I love the uh, mon monotonous tone he has the whole time narrating. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um. You got anything else? That's all, man. I mean, I know we're missing stuff. This was a lot to talk about. Hey, no, it's, we did a great job. You did a really good job, man. Thanks, man. <laughs> Again, become yourself. Become an authentic person. That's that's the message here, the main one. And hopefully uh, we made you think about this movie in a different way. Yeah, whether if you, yeah. if you always just looked at it on the surface, I think that it's really important to watch films and see what's underneath the surface and what it's really about, like this film. Great, be really beautiful. Oh God, that fight. was beautiful. I'm gonna fight you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be like I'm Tyler and you're your narrator in the parking garage. That's what's about to happen. I'm gonna find some stairs and toss you down them, and the security cam just gonna see you throw going down the stairs. Anyways, thanks so much for tuning in. Become a patron at Patreon.com/slash Razor of Lost Podcast. Really appreciate the support and for tuning in around the world wherever you're listening and watching right now. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. Find us on all audio streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Find us on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to check out one of these other videos right here for more content on our favorite films and breaking down all kinds of movie content. Thanks so much.